So there I was, writing a completely useless program that displays a blank window and nothing else. And then, on a whim, I decided to see what would happen if I tried running the program in DOS. Would it crash? Cause a lockup? Well, no. Instead, it simply printed the message, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, and then exited. But how did this modern 64-bit executable, one that I literally made yesterday, know that it was running under an ancient operating system like DOS? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at a lesser known part of the Microsoft Portable Executable format known as the MS-DOS Stub. The MS-DOS Stub is almost always 128 bytes long and consists of two parts. The first part is a 64-byte header, which is then followed by 64 bytes of executable code. Together, the DOS stub is designed to resemble a 16-bit MS-DOS executable so that when a user runs the executable inside DOS, the DOS stub will be the part that's actually executed, whereas Windows would simply ignore it. This is how a modern executable can tell if it's running in DOS, but let's take a deeper look at how it works, shall we? The DOS header begins with the bytes 4D5A hexadecimal, which encodes the letters MZ. These letters indicate that this is an executable file, and they were not chosen at random, but rather are the initials of Microsoft programmer Mark Zibakovsky. At offset 2 is a 2-byte value indicating how many bytes are in the final page of the file, with a page being 512 bytes of data. In this case, our file has 90 hex, or 144 bytes, and from what I can gather, this value is always the same, at least in the MS-DOS stub. At offset 4 is a 2-byte value indicating the length of the executable in pages, and again, this appears to be always 3 in Windows executable, regardless of how large the file actually is. At offset 6 is a 2-byte value indicating the number of entries in the program's relocation table. What is a relocation table, you ask? Well, when a program is first compiled, the compiler assumes that it's going to be loaded at a certain base address in memory, and thus, many of the addresses inside the executable will be hard-coded to a certain value. However, the program might end up being loaded at a completely different base address, so these hard-coded addresses will no longer be valid. What the relocation table does, effectively, is tell the loader which addresses in the program need fixing up so that the program can run properly. For the MS-DOS header, however, this value is always zero. At offset 8, we have the length in paragraphs of the header. A paragraph is just 16 bytes, and the value in our file is 4, meaning our header is 64 bytes in length. Next up is 2 bytes indicating the minimum number of paragraphs that the program needs to run, followed by 2 bytes indicating the maximum number of paragraphs the program would like allocated to it. For the purposes of the DOS stub, however, these values are simply the minimum and maximum values that can be stored in 2-byte variables. At offset E hexadecimal, we have the initial value of the stack segment register, which is added to wherever the program is loaded into memory. In our case, this is zero, indicating that the stack register will not be changed from the base address. As for what the stack segment is, we'll get to that later. This is followed by the initial value of the stack pointer, which here is B8 hexadecimal. Then at offset 12 hexadecimal, we have a checksum, which can be used to verify the integrity of the file, but here it's just zero. Then we have four bytes indicating the initial value of the instruction pointer and code segment register, effectively indicating where program execution begins. In our case, both of these are zero, which tells us that the program starts running at the first address it's located at. At offset 1a hex, we have the offset of the relocation table, and then at offset 1a hex, we have the program overlay number. What the hell is a program overlay, you ask? Well, overlays are just sections of the program that can be loaded and unloaded from memory in case the program is larger than the amount of memory your machine actually has. Our program doesn't use overlays, however, so this value is zero. Lastly, at offset 3C hex, we have the offset of the actual portable executable header, which is the only part of the MS-DOS stub that Windows actually cares about. This is then followed by some executable code, which I snipped off using a hex editor and then plugged it into a disassembler. As you can see, it consists of just seven CPU instructions, and this is some old-school DOS assembly. Specifically, this is a 16-bit real mode program, and it's called real mode because it uses real physical memory addresses instead of virtual ones. The first thing the code does is push the code segment register onto the stack and then pop it into the data segment register. 
Now wait, you say, what's all this nonsense about segments? To answer that question, we need to go all the way back to 1978, when Intel released the 8086, the very first x86 CPU. A lower cost version of this chip, called the 8088, would power the IBM PC, first released in 1981, and this is the reason why x86 is still the dominant architecture in PCs. Now, the 8086 had an interesting quirk. It used 20-bit memory addresses, but its registers were only 16 bits wide. Since registers often contain memory addresses, this causes a problem. Intel's brilliant solution was to divide memory into 64 kilobyte segments, and these segments weren't laid out end to end, but rather each one began at a multiple of 16 bytes or one paragraph. Memory addresses in code consisted of a 2 byte segment address, followed by a 2 byte offset into that segment. When the CPU went to access memory, it would take the segment address, shift it 4 bits to the left, and then add the offset to that value, giving the actual physical address. This system of memory segmentation is generally quite horrible and annoying to work with, so to make things a little easier, Intel gave the 8086 four segment registers. There is CS, or the code segment register, which holds the segment where the program's code resides. There is DS, or data segment register, which holds the segment for the program's data. There is the SS, or stack segment register, which not surprisingly points to the segment where the stack lives, and ES is the extra segment register, which can be used for whatever the programmer wanted. The way things worked is that when the CPU wanted to access memory, it would use the values in these registers as the segment portion of the address, and which register is used is determined by the type of instruction. Any operations dealing with code, such as instruction fetches or jump statements, would use a value in the code segment register. Operations involving data, such as move instructions, would use the data segment register, while stack operations, such as pops and pushes, would use the stack segment register. So, let's bring things back to our MS-DOS code. The first two instructions make the values in the code segment and data segment equal. Since our code is so small, just seven instructions, the code and the data can both reside in the same 64 kilobyte segment. Then the program moves the values E hexadecimal into the DX register and 9 hexadecimal into the AH register, that is the high byte of the AX register, before firing off interrupt 21 hex. Once again, this is classic DOS programming. The way programs interacted with DOS wasn't by calling a function, but by invoking software interrupts, and interrupt 21 hex was the primary DOS interface. You'd specify the function you wanted to invoke in the AX register, with the parameters of the function going into the other registers, and then you'd invoke the interrupt. If we look at Ralph Brown's interrupt list under interrupt 21H and then look up function for AH equaling 9, we see that this is the function that prints text to the screen, with a value in the DX register being the address of the string we want to print. If we look back at our code, we can see that the DX register does indeed point to the offset of the string that reads, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. The program then moves the value 4C01 hexadecimal into the AX register before invoking the DOS interrupt. Once again, we can look up these values in Ralph Brown's interrupt list to see that this is the function that will cause the program to terminate execution with a return value of 1, indicating an abnormal termination, because there's nothing normal about trying to run a Windows program on DOS. But all of this raises one very obvious question. Why do modern executables still include the MS-DOS stub? This might have made sense back in the Windows 9X days, when DOS and Windows programs lived side by side, but these days, the probability of someone trying to run a Windows program on DOS is practically non-existent. And I think the reason is that Microsoft's philosophy when it comes to Windows is that backwards compatibility is God. They are generally loath to change anything about the operating system that might result in older applications no longer working, to the point where this crappy Visual Basic program I made in Computer Camp from stolen assets still runs on Windows 11, despite having been made all the way back in 1999. And if you look at Windows API functions like MessageBox, you'll often find that there are additional variants like MessageBox EX, because when Microsoft comes up with a new version of a function, they don't replace the old one since that might break backwards compatibility. Instead, they just slap an EX for extended onto the name. And so it is with the DOS stub. Microsoft could remove it, but their line of thinking is probably, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
programs and OS functions that deal with EXE files expect it to be there, so removing it could possibly break things. And it's just 120 bytes, so it's not like it's wasting huge amounts of disk space or anything like that. So that's our brief dive into one of the more vestigial elements of Windows programming. And as someone who grew up using DOS, there is something oddly comforting in knowing that it still lives on in its own little way. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a classic DOS game to play. Derek Smart's Battlecruiser 3000! Derek Smart! Derek Smart! Derek Smart!